All right, welcome everyone um, and good afternoon. Thank you uh, for coming to our concluding session today of the NAFTA 2023 Leadership Summit, uh, Amplifying Associations Voices, Best Governing Practices. This session is gonna explore the value of associations to the individual as well as the profession and society and provide a general overview of good association governance discuss how to develop into an effective board member, and some practical tips for association volunteers. We would also like to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, Banfield Hospitals, for their generous support of this event. A few housekeeping items uh, before introducing our speaker for today's session. On the bottom of your screen, there is a button called Q&A. If you have a question for our presenter during the point of the presentation, you can submit it through the Q&A button. And there will be some time at the end of the presentation um, for questions, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. There is also a chat button on the bottom of your screen. You can use this feature to chat with other attendees, um, but please try to hold your speaker uh, questions for the Q&A um, as we are looking at the chat, but would like to ha have most of the questions answered there. At this time, I'd like to introduce our sponsor, Rachel Beck, Director of Technician Programs at Banfield Hospital, to introduce our session speaker for today. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for being with us today. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for our final session, today's Leadership Summit. We are joined today by Adrian Hochstadt, JDCAE, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Veterinary Medical Association Executives. Adrian joined BM, BMEA, AE, excuse me, in the role of CEO in February of 2022. After earning his law degree in 1985, he worked in government affairs and association management for the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, American Bar Association, and Accreditation Association for Ambulatory Healthcare. In 2005, Adrian joined the EBMA to create a program providing governmental uh, relations support for state BMAs and other veterinary associations allied with the EBMA. In 2016, he was appointed Deputy Chief Executive Officer of EBMA. Prior to joining as CEO, Adrian was a longtime VMAE member and has served as the organization's president, treasurer, and director. Welcome, Adrian, and thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I, I know that this is the last session and uh, you've been on Zoom for uh, for most of the day. So uh, I'm, I'm going to try to keep that in mind. Um, you've got the, uh, um, the, you know, you've heard about the goals of the session, a little bit about myself. I just want to add, um, you know, I know some of you from my days at the AVMA and um, as part of my deputy CEO, position, one of my responsibilities was to work closely with NAFTA. And I really enjoyed that part. And um, I kind of miss it. So I just I, I had to throw that in. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I've been um, on, on the new job for about a year now. And uh, we're about 140 executives who manage veterinary associations throughout North America, and I'm proud to say beyond recently. Um, and uh, we have several veterinary technician association members, NAFTA, of course, but several others as well. So I want to make sure that um, that that I get that in um, as, as part of the introduction. So uh, you've heard about uh, what we're going to try to do with, uh, we're going to talk about, um, you know, what, what does it mean to um, be an effective board member, uh, communicate throughout an association, um, some of the trends we're seeing, some practical tips and a general overview of association. So I'm gonna do my best to finish ahead of time so we can have an informal conversation about anything in the presentation or on your mind. So with that, let's get to uh, the meat of the presentation. Um, I have to throw in uh, whenever possible. Um, you need to see a Muffin and Cleo. Cleo um, is the uh, miniature schnauzer. Um, the terrier uh, that is uh, the one living member of our family here uh, with us, with, with my wife. Um, our three kids have grown and, and, and left the house. Uh, Muffin, um, our kitty, um, I, I like to say she was instrumental in my getting the AVMA job because we adopted her just before the AVMA called with a job offer. So I don't think that's a coincidence. But um, the rest of the images on the screen 
are uh, logos of various associations and associations have been a central part of my life. Um, some of these associations um, are places I worked at, some I volunteered at uh, or partnered with in some way. And, you know, we'll, we'll, let's begin with the most basic question. What is an association? And, and of course, um, on your screen, um, you see the IRS definition, but really the essence of it is um, it's a sense of community coordination really is at the heart of the association uh, profession. So associations began as a way to uh, gather information and knowledge and act as the collective voice of, of groups of individuals. And, um, you know, I, I did a little bit of research here to find out, you know, uh, what does the, um, the literature say about, you know, why do people join association? And it's really, you know, the core again, it's they want to work together on a common cause or they have something uh, of an interest they can advance more effectively as a group than a series of individuals. And associations also are a place where you can get, you know, leadership growth opportunities and self-fulfillment for so many of us. So it's it's really um, there are various causes, various reasons why people join, and they're all legitimate. They're all important. And um, hope we can we can share the slides. I'd be glad to um, uh, share these slides with you uh, rather than me reading all of these. But these are all really good um, good reasons why uh, folks like us join associations. And you know this trend towards community engagement and coordination has shaped and advanced the United States uh, really since its birth. Um, has historically set the U.S. apart from many other nations, although we're seeing associations growing in number internationally now. But uh, still, to this day, no other country has even close to as many associations as the United States. And associations make broad contributions to American life. Um, I have some numbers um, listed here. Uh, they're actually pretty staggering. I mean, it's interesting to note associations are the largest provider of continuing education. And we employ as many people as the airline industry, for example. So associations have a big economic impact in this nation. Congress first gave associations favored tax treatment, largely recognizing the benefit the public derives from their activities. And as tax exempt entities, associations undertake programs or initiatives to benefit members and the public rather than private individuals. So the earnings, therefore, are dedicated to further the primary pur purpose and uh, doesn't go to shareholders like you would in a for-profit uh, situation. You know, some associations, when they're small, they're run by volunteers at first, like VMAE. Then as you grow, your needs change beyond what volunteers can handle. The board of directors typically considers hiring an individual or an, a, a company. And successful associations feature a healthy volunteer staff partnership. They're really consensus driven. And culture is a huge uh, factor on governance and operations. So you hear sometimes, oh, you know, this association's member driven or well, this one's staff driven. The ultimate goal is a result driven partnership or mission driven. Um, there are various types of associations, you know, from trade associations to professional societies to federations of basically association of associations and, and groups um, that, that focus on certification or accreditation. And there are also various tax classifications, C3, C4, C6, and all of these could be, you know, uh, the topic of a whole course uh, for a whole day. Um, and, you know, so what are the benefits that an association provides their members? And again, you could see uh, some of these probably look familiar. You are a leader in your association. Um, I'm sure you recognize some of these right away. They typically um, uh, end up in one of three main buckets of benefits, advocacy, products and services, and opportunity for volunteer involvement. And I believe looking at the agenda for today's program, you've heard a little bit about all of these, um, all of these three buckets. And here are some of the most common functions. Uh, not every association does all these things. Um, 
Some don't do any advocacy at all. You know, um, some don't do any fundraising or foundations, but these are the typical functions that you see in most associations. And we're, we're gonna talk about governance a little bit more here in a moment. And um, I also went back, I really like this book. Uh, it's in a reference, I have a reference slide at the end, uh, The Decision of Volunteer. And again, you know, uh, there's actually research on this. Um, and we find, no surprise, um, members of associations are highly engaged um, and they're there for the values. And we also learn you want to get volunteers to, to be involved, ask them directly. I think we all know this, um, you know, um, a mass email is never going to never gonna do the job of a personal email or a phone call. And um, I think we all know that. Um, and you, we want to make the experience of the volunteer meaningful and valuable um, and recognize them or, or you know, why, why do they come back? They're not getting paid, right? There's got to be something else that brings folks back and, and get them excited and, um, and brings that self-fulfillment. And now, you know, of course, associations are challenged. We have several generations in our membership. Uh, we wanna make sure everybody's welcome and there might be different ways of reaching out to different, um, different groups. Uh, more and more, we see the volunteer that is very interested in a particular task or project. They're not interested in a six-year term on a committee that meets regularly. Uh, so again, and some of those folks, we still have some of those folks too. So, we, you know, the associations have to be nimble enough to provide different opportunities for different people. Um, there's also research on uh, reasons why people don't volunteer and lack of information about opportunities is one. Uh, poor follow through, um, forgetting to thank them for communication and lack of support um, or training. These are all things that um, can come back and really uh, provide obstacles uh, for folks. And by the way, you know, for some people, it's, you know, if we expect them to pay their own way to meetings or, um, you know, conferences, they may not have the financial means um, or, you know, their roles might be unclear and they just kind of, you know, give up. So all these things, um, you know, we're very cognizant of when we run associations. Now, uh, you see a photograph of um, Rebecca Rose, CVT. I have a feeling a lot of you know Rebecca. Rebecca, um, help me out. I did this presentation for the Leadership Forum of NAFTA about four years ago. It was in person in Chicago, and Rebecca was there. And Rebecca, uh, you know, uh, has so much insight. Uh, she's been uh, an incredible volunteer for different organizations over the years. And Rebecca, also CVT, you know, uh, she was very generous with some of her tips and some of her um, uh, pieces of advice, and I got her permission to include uh, in, in these in on the slide. Uh, as far as how um, you know, she she's been engaging in in uh, organized veterinary medicine and veterinary technician association for years. And the thing I remember her saying, um, you know, uh, in, in being engaged in these associations, they opened up a variety of amazing opportunities. Um, in personal and professional growth and learning. It's been a magical ride. So um, Rebecca is a fantastic mentor for anyone interested in expanding, you know, their volunteerism in the profession. And also she had some tremendous tips. Why, well, you know, I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. I mean, her, her words are, are, are spot on point. You know, try to help other folks. Is there anything I can do for you? to be the focus, you know, uh, at a cocktail reception, you run into folks and you can learn so much by observing a group and watching people, you know, um, you know silence and observation are very powerful tools. And then the other thing she said, I remember she said, she said, you know, don't be afraid of taking a calculated risk. It's good to step outside of your comfort zone, find an association meeting. Maybe you don't know a lot of people, and through casual conversation, you're going to find something in common, you know, with other group members. Ask open-ended questions. Keep the conversation flowing. And it's one thing that kind of threw me back. I didn't expect, um, you know, dress professionally. Uh, Rebecca's point is that uh, feeling underdressed is uncomfortable, doesn't convey a level of professionalism, and you want to be seen as a professional and someone who's going to contribute and make a positive impact. So that stayed with me. I took notes and here they are. <laughs> I wanted to share those with you from one of your peers, uh, someone who's done this very well. 
a little bit about some of your um, obligations. You know, if you're a member of a, a board of directors of an association, you know, we need to keep in mind that not-for-profit um, associations or corporations are uh, creatures of state law. So in, in Illinois, for example, we have a not-for-profit corporation act and they authorize the formation of an association. Um, and they have very minimum requirements. You know, you need a governing board. You may need a member meeting once a year, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's pretty easy to comply with. The Articles of Incorporation is the next level document. That's a legal document that you file with the state to create that not-for-profit corporation. So again, not a lot of detail in the articles. The bylaws, the next level down, is that document the association developed. It has to be consistent with state law, which is not typically very difficult. The bylaws provide how the association is governed. So they address things like membership requirements, types of memberships, frequency of meetings, uh, how the bylaws get amended, electing directors and officers, voting procedures, and more. Best practice is not to go into too much detail, but you got to have some basic rules on how to govern the organization. And then the next level down with more detail are policies and forms. And these greatly uh, vary by association and they can touch many operational aspects like expense reports. Um, and more importantly, you know, protecting the association with policies on things like conflict of interest, antitrust, confidentiality, and, and much more. Um, let's go to some of the legal responsibilities that um, a board member has. So I'm gonna call the governing body, which the state law refers to governing body. So for most organizations, we call them the board of directors. Um, they can be called executive board or, or really any other name, but uh, we'll call them the board, the governing body that's responsible um, for the strategic direction and overall management of the association. And with that, the law imposes certain fiduciary duties on individuals serving on the governing body, the duty of care, duty of loyalty, duty of obedience. And really, if we had to shorten it to one very, very basic rule is that a board member must act reasonably, prudently, and in the best interest of the organization. Um, and that's the important part here. So let's go to the next slide. Talk about duty of care a little bit. Um, this doesn't mean that the board has to make the right decision every single time, which is not a standard that could be met. Uh, board member will not be judged by the outcome of the decision necessarily, but on an ordinary and reasonable standard, due diligence. So what does that mean? So um, the risk of personal liability can be minimized by just being prepared, you know, prepare in advance, attend meetings. If you're not sure about something, Request, you know, legal consultation uh, if you're not sure about the legal ramifications. Review documents, audited and unaudited financial reports of the association. Uh, read publications, you know, look at the bylaws from time to time and other governing documents. So be knowledgeable and do your homework. The duty of loyalty, really, uh, uh, the shorthand here is uh, a director must place the association's interest over their own personal interest. So the loyalty is um, to the board of directors. And by the way, not necessarily to the group or organization that may have put you on the board. You may have been nominated or selected by another organization. But once you're on the board of directors, you have loyalty to that organization. You have to look at their best interest. And the duty of confidentiality, if documents are deemed confidential, obviously, you, you know, directors must uh, carefully safeguard uh, that and, and sometimes you're not sure of something confidential, ask. Duty of obedience. Um, so here, uh, the, the main point is you want to make sure you don't undermine the, the rest of the board. So you may not personally agree with the decision. You may vote against that decision, in fact. But once the decision's made, every board member uh, needs to support the decision. You air concerns during deliberations, not after the decision's made. So it doesn't mean that you need to be enthusiastic and promote the decision, but you can't say something like, well, you know, I didn't vote for it. I don't think it's a good idea. You know, they passed it. You have to, you have to stay away from that type of statement because it undermines the entire board. So that's the duty of obedience. 
And uh, central to all of these um, legal duties is conflict of interest. And whether you have a conflict, you're not sure you have a conflict, you have a potential conflict, you're not sure you have a conflict, best to have uh, a policy where there's disclosure. So you disclose anything you think might be problematic, even if it, you, it may not be, but if you think it could be perceived as a conflict, whether it's financial or whether it's you, you know you have you have a relative that is you know works for a company that's trying to you know get an association business those kind of things just disclose it and let let the board determine whether you need to be recused uh, from that particular issue or perhaps it's so minor that uh, disclosure is sufficient the key here is disclosing potential conflicts of interest a couple other things um as far as governance sometimes there's confusion about this um, all the other entities in the association are advisory. They report to the board of directors, that governing body that state law refers to. They have the fiduciary duties we just talked about. You may serve on a communications committee, on an advocacy committee, what have you. They make recommendations to the board. The board is ultimately responsible for those decisions, even if they delegate some of those responsibilities. Ultimately, there's only one governing body, and those committees task forces, council, whatever we call them, they're advisory in nature. Um, strategic planning, uh, obviously a very important responsibility for the, for the board. And you all often hear staff is operational, the board's strategic. Um, and so the, the, the and, and sometimes it's very difficult to really have a very clear line. Um, things overlap on one side or the other. But it, it, there's no question that the strategic planning is something that is um, a very important responsibility for the board to set the direction of the associations. Um, it, it really needs to be done. Well, it used to be three to five years. I'd say three years is the max now. And it really should be reviewed ongoing. And uh, I know for VMAE, um, every single board meeting, we have four board meetings a year, we have as an agenda item, review of the strategic plan and maybe an issue or two we wanna really pick out and have kind of a, a mega discussion. And if we need to, we're gonna tweak that strategic plan. Things change way too quickly, um, three to five years. I mean, if you look at the most strategic plans that were done in 2018 or 19, and you look three years later, what they're actually doing, it's gonna be very different. Um, they could change the curve so, so rapidly now. Um, Mission statement, you know, ours is to help VMA executives create thriving organizations and provide effective leadership within the veterinary profession. Very, I think most uh, not-for-profits have a mission statement. Some adopt vision statements, which are more future-oriented and aspirational, and even value statements. Other very important board responsibilities here, um, you know, relating to the finances of the organization, obviously, um, overseeing um, and hiring and firing the chief executive officer, hopefully not firing, um, protecting the tax exempt status, leadership development, um, more and more diversity, equity, and inclusion is becoming an important um, responsibility um, of governing bodies. Um, and, and so these are some of the, the things that come to mind right away as far as uh, what the board should be looking at. Um, I'm also going to borrow um, from Dr. Mia Terry. Uh, so I think a lot of you probably know Mia as well. She, she was also presenting at the 2019 program, and I, I took some notes, and um, I've been using these. But I love this. You know, well-functioning boards, um, you know, they have three features in, 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 sort of in common that we see over and over again. Um, encouraging board member engagement um, and it's, it's partly the responsibility of the board chair or president, but it's really up to each individual board member also. Um, you know, uh, one of the nice ways to do that is to have icebreakers at the beginning of board, of board calls or in-person meetings. You create conversation. I, I think it's really important to have, you know, dinners or cocktail receptions. Make sure that board members have some time together to, to know one another, especially if your meetings are primarily you know, uh, Zoom remote, uh, I think it's important to try to find some in-person time for people to get to know one another because they typically work better together that way. Um, another very important role of the board chair or president is enabling the board to work effectively as a group. 
And that goes to things like creating a meeting agenda that contains most relevant strategic topics, um, ensure that all board members participate, you know, and focusing on allowing the board to make decisions versus imposing their own position on a given topic. And board members should be encouraged to provide effective, timely feedback, um, allow time for reflection and learning during each meeting, another very important, um, I, I think, tool in your toolbox. And, um, you know, for sustainable collaboration, um, I, you know, again, I, I borrowed from uh, a very, very uh, informative article in the Harvard Business Review, some, some pointers on things like teach, you know, teach people to listen, not to talk, you know, uh, train people to practice empathy. Some of this, I think it's, um, it's a type of, of, of individuals you bring to the board. And also, you know, training is very helpful, board training. But um, you are practicing and developing these skills um, in attending this leadership forum, uh, for example. So congratulations on making the choice to participate. Um, some of the trends we're seeing um, around uh, the association world, we're seeing more and more um, ad hoc task forces and working groups, fewer standing committees. And that goes to the nimbleness of organizations. Uh, things don't take as long typically. And you see this in the governance structure. A lot of uh, organizations uh, are going down to a very small board for that reason, um, because they need to react much more quickly than in the past. We're seeing a lot of increased competition for continuing education. It used to be CE was a big moneymaker, um, big revenue uh, producer for association. It is big coming more and more difficult. You have competition for, you know, from for profits, from global entities, there's more of an acceptance of remote learning. And that brings in a whole host of actors that provide, frankly, pretty good CE, you know, and it's, 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 um, it's a very competitive market now uh, for continuing education. We're seeing associations react in different ways, we're starting to see different um, levels of membership benefits where you might might have had just, you know, one um, one dues, you know, uh, you had dues for one individual member. Now you have things like group uh, discounts, or, or, you know, group memberships or different tiers. Um, tier one, you get certain level of benefits and then uh, tier two and tier three, depending on, on your needs. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of creativity you know, in the association world. Um, one thing that's impacting associations, no question about it, is the fact that more veterinary professionals are working in a group or corporate practice. And of course, you know, we need to adjust because the needs of a practice owner, um, you know, or a partner, um, is gonna be different than the needs of a veterinarian or veterinary technician working in, in a place where they might be able to get their CE, they might be able to get their networking, you know, um, and another support from their corporation. So what are they looking for in an association? So we need to be uh, nimble, creative, work with the corporate groups. Uh, in fact, I have a meeting um, at the Western um, Veterinary Conference next week with some of the executives of uh, some of the large national practices. And these are uh, gonna include some individuals who probably don't know much about organized veterinary medicine. And we wanna, uh, you know, uh, show them the benefit of, for their organization to have their veterinary professionals engaged in organized veterinary medicine, because they're going to be probably wondering, well, what's in it for us? Uh, why should we be paying the dues for, for our employees? I want to make sure they understand the value of organized veterinary medicine. Um, I mentioned DEI and well-being, another huge issue. You know, I started with ADMA in 2005. There was frankly, very little conversation around well-being of veterinary professionals, diversity, equity, inclusion, and now they are, uh, there are priorities for the profession for, um, and for associations. Well, at VMA, we have two major initiatives underway, uh, one well-being, one DEI, which I'd be glad to talk to you um, offline, but that, that's true of lots of organizations. I know AVMA is doing a lot in, in that space, and, and, and NAFTA, and, and, and many others. And we can't forget, uh, we have to keep an eye on the big picture um, because associations are obviously a reflection of the larger society, changes in technology, you know, climate change, demographic changes um, definitely impact our associations in many, many ways. 
So I was pretty brief um, because I wanted to give us a chance to uh, to have a little more informal conversation. The last slide is um, one of references um, from Rebecca's blog, which I think you'd really enjoy. Um, at the bottom there, um, all the way to you know some of the books, um, the publications, um, including some work by the, um, I'm sorry, ah, there we go, question. Some of the work by the American Society of Association Executives. Yes, there's an association for association execs. Um, and there, there's some really interesting readings if you'd like to follow up. So Lauren and, and Rachel, I'd be glad to take um, questions or hear from our participants at this point. Great, and Adrian, do you mind just flipping back one slide to that reference page? We've had a request. Yeah, I, I didn't even mean to. <laughs> great. So we've had a really great, um, interesting question come in here from one of our participants who has I would say a smaller association, probably under 200 so members. So their question, um, is, they have a couple questions. One is, who would you recommend is probably the best professional resource for uh, doing and help with the application for 501c6 status? Would that be a CPA, a lawyer, a another professional? Yeah, I, I would. Um... I would play it safe and go to a lawyer. Um, and there are law firms that specialize in association law, which is a pretty niche thing. I think most attorneys would be able to file a 501c6. They're not as difficult to get as C3s. C3s are a little more difficult to get. But certainly, um, if, if, if they're aware of someone in their state or their area, um, who um, may be supporting an association, you know, like a council for one of the associations, maybe the state VMA or a veterinary technician association. If they have a lawyer, that lawyer um, should be able to file a 501c6 and it really shouldn't be too expensive. It's, it's not that difficult, frankly, you know. Um, each state also has, uh, I mentioned ASAE, which is the National um, American Society for Association Execs. Each state has, I'll call it a chapter or, a, you know, a, a smaller organization. And if you spend some time on the website of the state's society of association executives, you're going to see um, they, they'll probably have some sort of directory. And there should be several law firms listed, hopefully, that, you know, and then probably any of them. You know, I mean, you, know, you can pick two or three and talk to them. And, and that's a good way to select a lawyer for this as well. Awesome. So. And kind of a, along the same lines, what would you say are, do you think that the essential legal documents for a small association differ from those for a large one? And then kind of piggybacking off of that, are there, do you think a small association needs to have like a full-blown mission statement, strategic plan? policies, procedures, how in-depth would you kind of advise those to be? And, and they need to be customized to the needs of the organization. So a small organization, it may not even have staff. So it's it's very challenging, you know, to do all those things we talked about full, full blast, right? Um, I think you should have some structure, though, to know that, you know, you're all rowing in the same direction, right? So a strategic plan could be very simple, but it's, it's an important conversation to have for any board, you know, to make sure that, again, you know, you're all on the same page. So, no, you don't need, you know, dozens and dozens of policies. If, if you're a small organization and you haven't run into certain situations, you, you want to keep it, you want to keep it simple, you know, uh, but, but you want to make sure you're in compliance with your state law. Doesn't matter your size. And it's, again, not difficult to do, but you're going to need an Articles of Incorporation. You're going to need... Um, hopefully, you know, either a, a, a 501c tax exemption, uh, which is the federal tax um, thing, and then you have the state incorporation, you want to be incorporated to protect your members and directors from liability. So you want to be incorporated under state law. And you want to read that state law, which again, not very difficult, but you want to make sure that you comply. If they, if they ask for, you know, a yearly report, you want to make sure that you're on top of that, whether you're large or small. 
And again, for small size organization, it's going to be a lot more simple and it, not as time consuming. So you have to you have to scale depending on your needs. Is there any particular policy? Like there are nominations policies, conflict of interest policies. Um, I'm trying to think of all the different financial policies. Is there any one of those in particular that you would say an association of any size should have like a detailed policy for? The things to, to jump at me are, um, and I trust, and I trust is something that could ruin the organization. If, if, if the F2C or the Department of Justice come after an association, uh, it could be it could be disastrous, you know, for for everybody involved. So I think an antitrust policy, um, and and you have to you have to make sure you follow the policy. You know, the, the other point, the other one I think is conflict of interest. Because again, it goes to those legal duties. Um, and so you know, you may also want to have um, duty of confidentiality. If you if you have any concerns with that, you know, make sure that your director sign those three policies. So you know, duty of confidentiality, antitrust, and uh, conflict of interest are the thing, the policies that come to mind first. That's great. Someone asked assistance in helping to draft these policies. I know that I often reference ASAEs. Um, uh, they have a really great collaborate forum for some of these and yeah. some of it is easily searchable. What about does VMAE also have some of uh, references for kind of standard policies out there? We have a lot of materials on our website. I was shocked when I came on VMAE that we have a lot of stuff. Now some is has been up there for a while, so it's a challenge to update it. But we do have, um, we have some forms definitely donated by by associations. You know, BMA's website's a good source. Um, the um, I think uh, yeah, one of my references, Board Source, they do a really good job with with templates. Yeah. They're really good and, and good speakers, by the way, on, on association topics too. Um, so that's another very good uh, resource. And by the way. Uh, Feel free to contact me, you know, and, uh, you know, these things come up and we, we you know, uh, we can work together perhaps to find the right resource for you. I'll also throw in contact NAFTA. We're happy to share um, any of our policies too, to help you kind of just have a model um, for you guys to bring back to your boards and decide on what you'd like to keep and what you don't. Um, so another participant has asked, um, a couple questions about bylaws. One is, do you need a lawyer or attorney to adjust your bylaws? And two, should bylaws include a dissolution dissolution clause? I don't think you necessarily need a lawyer. I mean, obviously, having someone familiar with bylaws is helpful, but you could take a look at some templates. You can take a look, you know, VMAE, NAFTA, other organizations. Um, Typically, you will see the solution. There's several provisions you typically see in, in most bylaws. Um, who's a member? Um, how do you elect directors and officers? How do you change the bylaws? Um, yeah, what happens at, what happens um, at termination, the solution? I think that's important. It's, you know, and, and, and their language is not difficult to find. That's pretty uh, typical in, in, in most templates. But I'll take a look at some templates and take a look at how other associations, especially some of the same size or type um, of yours and, and, and see what other folks have done and because they probably paid a lot of money for lawyers to have that drafted and um, there they are, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, and they become public, you know, domain. Uh, a lot of times you find bylaws on, you know, an organization's website and we do such a great job in our community of sharing you know, one of the benefits of being a VMAE member for the executive, you can get on a listserv and ask for help for all these things we talked about. And I can assure you, your colleagues would jump in and send you their bylaws, their provisions, their policies, even if we don't have them on the website, because that's the whole point of VMAE is networking and, sh and helping one another, you know, so. Um, and also for very small organizations that don't have a executive director, but there is a volunteer who's 
primarily responsible for administration, they could qualify as a member as well, you know, uh, for small organizations. And even if you're not a member, we'll, also, we'll help you anyway, obviously. You know, we're, like I said, our mission is to help create thriving organizations in veterinary medicine. You know, that's our number, that's why we exist. So we'll do everything we can to support uh, our colleagues. From my perspective, I think the only time or one of the, a good reason to have a lawyer to look over your bylaws is if you are really concerned about violating anything, any of your changes from violating the state law where your association is incorporated. Um, so I think as long as you have a good familiarity with that, <laughs> the changes that you're doing aren't going to go against any of that then you could probably be okay without that legal advice. Well, as uh, as a uh, recovering attorney, I have to I, <laughs> I have to say the safest thing to do is to hire an attorney licensed in your in yeah. your state. That is the safe way to go. Obviously, yeah. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I don't want to give people the wrong advice. Here. <laughs> um, Along with some of the resources that we've shared about bylaws, templates, policies, and procedure templates, do you have any good resources for developing a strategic plan? There's a lot of liter literature out there. Um, and I'd be, I'd be glad to, to work offline with, with folks on that. Uh, again, some of these, any association um, for association execs are gonna have, are gonna have tools you know, for strategic planning. Um, the best thing though, uh, it, it really, it, you know, a good facilitator will have the right, the right documents and the right way of doing it. We, we use Doug Raven, who, who's a former executive director of the Ontario VMA, and, but there are many, many others out there. And that's the key is to have a good facilitator. And that facilitator will, uh, will work with the association in developing, it's usually, a good practice is to survey the membership first to see what their needs are. And then you bring that to the board and you figure out what are the priorities, you know, um, but member input is so critical. But there are also templates out there. There, you know, on any aspect of association management, there are references, materials, articles, um, because we've been around a long time. So there's a, there's a lot of material out there. Yeah, that's great. This question that's come in from attendee um, is a little bit uh, different. They're wanting to ask for ideas on how to help get people who are not typically involved in, on the board and the association um, more involved so that um, they don't have the same people serving on the board over and over again, kind of so the same voices are being heard over and over again. Do you have any kind of ideas or tips that you have in kind of getting more volunteers engaged with the board and getting them onto a board? I'll reference something I, I said a few minutes ago, and that is a direct ask. Um, I'm trying to think back. All of the volunteer positions I, I applied for or you know I received were because someone asked me, someone in authority asked me, would you be willing to serve, you know, on this board or on this committee? Um, a, a lot of us are reluctant to just kind of, you know, you look at an email, oh, you know, nominations are, are due, I can submit my nominations. I, it's much more effective if a board member calls you, you know, and, and says, Lauren, you know, I've, you know you've, uh, I've seen you at meetings, you know, we've talked about different things, you know, you, you're an engaged, um, you know, any technician, you know, we, we would, we need somebody with your skill sets and energy and enthusiasm. Would you be willing to serve on the board? Um, you can imagine, you know, compare that with an email that goes out to, you know, all the members, you're much more inclined to say yes, but I think it's, you know, the personal ask is the key, you know, and then the leaders of the association need to keep an eye out for volunteers. You know, you see people showing up to things. You see people participating, providing feedback. Okay, you know, um, you almost always have to have a, either a mental or a written list of potential board members. You know, um, I know we do, you know, and we have a governance committee. And uh, of course, we also ask as part of the um, dues renewal, 
are you interested in volunteering? And if yes, you know, we have the list of committees and we also have board. And it's surprising, you know, you, you might get some yeses from people that, you know, you wouldn't guess. Um, and so that's that's another tool, you know, to kind of gather. But I think the personal personal communication is the best way, the best way of um, reaching people who might be reluctant, you know, to it's it's hard to say no, you know, when someone reaches out personally to you and says, hey, you know, you'd be great for this. Would you do it? It's really hard to say, well, no, you know, uh, but it's also hard if nobody reaches out to you, you know, to apply for some, you know, some position, you know, some people don't do that and some don't. So um, I think the personal touch is, is really uh, very helpful. I will just chime in there. I know in my past experience, um, I've seen that work uh, amazingly as well. When a board member reaches out to a, a volunteer in the field and personally extends that invite to them to participate in the nominating process, um, that that really kind of puts people to put their hat in the ring that probably weren't thinking about it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um kind of thinking through and I will just go ahead and just put another call out there if anyone has any questions please feel free to put them here in the Q&A box um maybe just some practical questions here do you have any good tips for organizing a board meeting agenda um again there's there's lots of really great resources so um there are a couple of programs we 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 put out for our, our members in helping the helping the the chief elected officer and the chief staff executive. We bring them together um, at the VLC in Chicago. We have a program um, every other year. It's a day long program. Every other year, it's 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 only um, it, it's it's a shorter hour and a half. And you bring together those two key leaders, and you talk about you know, how to set the agenda, how to work together more broadly. But this year we had uh, a really good um, presenter. So in 2023, we had the hour and a half version, the, the president president elect forum. And yeah, we went through, we went through an agenda and it actually it made such an impact on us that the VMAE agenda has been, we're gonna change the way we do meetings because, um, we typically want to just, you know, we're thinking, okay, what are the things we need to take, you know, take care of and, and, and do? And rather than that, you put all of those sort of operate more operational things at the, at the back end of the agenda. And you start out with this mega issue or a generative discussion, I think was the term that she used. And that's, that's an approach Glenn Tecker um, has been advi advising as well. So when people are fresh and, 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 and uh, they have energy, um, you talk about a big strategic issue and then you move to the sort of things you got to do okay you know every board man you're gonna you're gonna have some things that you, you just need to do but i think that's a really uh we, we tried it for the first time last board meeting it worked really well um and that also uh selfishly i i like that because we don't get into in somebody's um more minor issues you know uh if they're if they're up front it, it, they might shockingly take a long, long time and, and have all these tangents, you know, and every board member is going into all these directions. This way, when they have that energy, it goes into a strategic issue. It's really where their attention should go, not whether we should spend $5,000 to go to a, you know, a, a meeting or something like that. It should be a strategic plan. You know, should we, should we make changes in the strategic plan? Should we go in another direction, you know, big picture? And then when people get tired, it gets closer to the end, where you got to run through, hey, let's make sure we finish on time. Uh, those, you know, important issues don't get um, shorted, you know, uh, which, which happens, which happens quite a bit, actually. I remember the meeting before that, it was really frustrating. We had some really important things to talk about, but they were at the end of the agenda. That was that not, not a, you know, not a way to do that. It's, um, so we learned, but again, there are templates, Glenn Tecker, um, Board source again. I you know I'd be glad to talk individually, folks, and we can. Um, I'll be glad to share VMA's agenda. I'm sure NAFTA. You know you, you guys have board agendas, and we, we could share with um, other organizations that want to take a peek. 
uh, be glad to. Absolutely. Kind of sticking on the topic of um, board meetings, when a board has a contentious issue that they're debating, what are some tips that you can share to help get a consensus so that the board can act as one voice? Yeah, and that's where the skill and training of the board chair is so key. You know, because yeah. staff, we have to be careful. You, you don't want to look like you're interfering and you have to give the board space, right? Which means you don't interrupt people, you don't cut people off. Uh, but the board chair has to make sure that the discussion doesn't get out of hand, go again, these tangents that happen so much. Um, and and the, the, the training of board members, is, it, 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 it's something that, that, that needs to be addressed on the training side because th it's gonna happen and it, it's healthy. It's healthy for a board to have discussions on difficult topics, I, I think. That's not necessarily something to run away from because they're there to do the hard work. That's why you're a board member. You know, uh, you signed up for important decisions. And some of the important decisions these days are fraught with all sorts of political and social issues. Um, at some point, I think the board chair needs to realize, okay, we've heard... We've heard the arguments for, against. Um, every perspective that's relevant here has been heard. Time to cut off the conversation, you know, and time to take action, whether it's to defer or, or vote for or against. But that's a skill. You know, it's really hard to have a one-size-fits-all rule. It, it goes to um, the, the, the training and the skill of the person. And, of course, the staff can help. You may want to call a timeout you know, and, and have a conversation with the board chair. But there's certain things that are out of bounds, you know, uh, treating other board members uh, respectfully. That, that's, a, that's a must. That, that's something that has to be in the culture, again, the, the training. But it's also the board chair needs to cut that off. If you see, uh, you know, uh, abusive language, you know, uh, threatening language, uh, disrespectful behavior, that has to be cut off. By, by the board chair, and if it gets bad enough, I think I think that the staff needs to needs to step in uh, if it gets that far. Hopefully, that never happens. But healthy discussion, different points of view, you know, um, that's healthy for an organization, you know. But uh, it, it's 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 you got to make sure you don't let it get too out of hand either. Some great insight along those lines. If a board member has a conflict of interest on an item that the board is deliberating, what would you say is the best practice for that board member? Do they need to leave the meeting? It depends on how serious the conflict is and how remote the conflict is. And that's really, um, the person needs to leave the room and, and, and the rest of the board needs to make a decision. So it could be as serious as the person needs to uh, step down from the board entirely, you know? All the way to, thank you for disclosing. We don't see a problem here. You know, um, you could stay. And many times it's the middle ground, right? It's the, it's the um, we think it's healthier if you left the room. Uh, what I would not um, advocate for is, yeah, we think you have a conflict of interest. Um, just remove that hat that, you know, from your previous role and put on your board hat. People don't work that way. I mean, I think it's healthier to just have the person out, you know, uh, out of the room. Um, because just by, by being in the room, you could impact the conversation. Even if you say, well, I'm not going to vote, you know. Yeah, but um, I, I think that, uh, you know, some board members are going to be reluctant to really speak their mind at that point because you're in the room. So at, I think at that point, it's better just not to be in the room. But some, some conflicts or perceived conflicts are, are, are very minor, you know, and again, it's, it's up to the board. There's no right or wrong. As long as it's disclosed in advance and the board has a chance to act on it, um, there's no easy rule here. Um, you just have to look at the circumstances. Do you think there's any particular way that that should be reflected in the minutes, which are the legal record of a board meeting? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 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 Should, should it be, it be like be. person A has disclosed a conflict of interest and recused themselves from this item or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It should be reflected in the minutes. Yeah. 
great. Seeing no other kind of questions um, that have come through, uh, I think we are wrapping up here uh, our summit for today. Adrian, thank you so much for sharing um, all of your tips and uh, wonderful insight into associations and governance. It's um, a topic that I very nerdily really love, um, but and I'm really glad that people stuck around with us today to talk about it because um, it's some of the just really great um, background stuff that we need to understand in order to really govern our associations effectively and be an effective force for our members. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for the 2023 Leadership Summit. Um, we hope that you will join us for future NAFTA CE events, and I just would like to thank you all and hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and weekend. And thank you. I really enjoyed uh, being with you again. Thank you for the invitation. It was really fun. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.